Well, good morning, everyone. You can do better than that, can't you? Come on. Good morning, everyone. Aren't you, aren't you glad to see me? It's good to be seen. <laughs> oh, good morning. Uh, if you have a Bible this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at verses 21 through 26. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. And while you're doing that, uh, let me just reiterate what Pastor Eric said in his uh, message. Thank you to everyone who helped out uh, yesterday. It was a fantastic day. But I especially want to say thank you to uh, Janine and Cynthia and John Guerrera. They really put in a lot of work in planning and preparing and, uh, yeah, really making sure that everything went smoothly. And, uh, again, we... Uh, Spent some time during the week going over things, and uh, they did a fantastic job just working through. And you know, uh, Cynthia, she, she gets on to something, she works it through, and, and she really did a lot of work in getting things done. And so we uh, appreciate uh, all of your giving, your time, and uh, everything that you've done uh, for this. So I just want to mention one other thing. This Wednesday night, we have First Wednesday. Before I forget, if you're interested in coming, 7 o'clock right here in the sanctuary, we have a time of worship and prayer. And uh, once in a while, we have a, a devotional. This Wednesday, we have uh, uh, Reverend Mui, who's coming, and ministers in healing. So he'll be praying for people who are sick. And so if you're interested in that, you're sick, and you want to come and have someone pray for you, anoint you with oil, and pray over you, uh, Wednesday night would be a great time for you to come and be a part of that service. All right, Matthew chapter 5. Are you ready? Beginning in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire." So, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we come before you this morning and we just want to quiet ourselves uh, before you, Lord. We ask you to sort of move the noise in our head, Lord, and the things that may be coming this week, things that happened last week, or the busyness of our lives, whatever it might be, the worries, fears, concerns, whatever they might be, Lord. We just want to quiet ourselves before you. We want to open up our hearts to you. We welcome your presence. Lord, give us ears to hear this morning. Help us to hear what you're saying to us in the scriptures. We believe that the scripture is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, an infallible guide. It will not lead us astray. So God, we ask for your help this morning to hear, to listen, and to respond in obedience to what you say to us. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that America is more divided and angrier than I've ever seen in my lifetime. We are more divided over more issues than ever before. Just think about politics, of course. Everything is political now, isn't it? Everything. Man, we are divided, Republicans and Democrats, conservatives, progressives, and not only are we divided, I mean, we are just angry at each other, aren't we? Well, nobody wants to admit that, do they? I didn't get any amens there. <laughs> 
We are divided over so many political issues. And again, everything becomes political eventually, right? Uh, money, our economy, we are divided over on the best way to handle the budget and how to deal with the inequalities that do exist in our culture, what the causes are and what the solutions are. And we are divided over those things. We're divided over racial issues. I think we all recognize that racism is wrong. We acknowledge a horrible history that is a part of our nation. And yet we are so divided over the lingering effects of that to what extent and how to solve those things. We're, we're split. Again, Republicans and Democrats, conservatives, progressives. Recent legislation in several states across the nation has thrown the issue of abortion right back up to the forefront. Some states are passing laws that will restrict abortion, to which I say amen. I am happy for that. But that, of course has resurfaced this whole discussion about when life begins and people are fighting over those issues. If you're like me, you scroll through your, your social media, Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is, and there it is, right? The debates and the fights. And, and again, it's not that people are just having conversations about these things and talking about these things. And it's not even that they're, just, they're passionate about these things. They are angry. I mean, Civility has gone out the window, hasn't it? We are divided over issues of human sexuality, marriage, and again, I'll invite you to scroll through my uh, social media, and again, it seems that it's just popping up over and over and over again. Social media hasn't helped I think it's made it worse. You know, we're trying to squeeze discussions into 40 characters or whatever it is, whether you're on Twitter or Instagram, limitations, and we're trying to have meaningful conversations and through a medium that was not intended for that very purpose. And if you're like me, you get caught up in that once in a while. Pandemic didn't help any, did it? Man, we've had a couple of years of some pretty serious fighting and division over whether to mask or not, whether to vaccinate or not, and how to handle all of that, lockdowns and all kinds of mandates. And considering all of the lockdowns and the impact economically that's had on people and the social impact that that has had on people, man, you've got a recipe for disaster. People are angry. Google it. Researchers and sociologists are talking about the rise in anger and the lack of civility that is taking place in our nation. It's toxic right now. It is terrible. I know people that have left their church over these issues, over the masking or not masking and the discussions about race that surface with the death of George Floyd and things that were said from a church or things that weren't said from a church. People are angry, and that has now crept into our lives as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Now, we're living in a culture where we're breathing in the air of, of again, what I would say is toxic right now in our nation. Road rage has entered our vocabulary. It's been around for a long time. If you're like me and you come in early on some days, I don't know, I seem to get stuck behind the one person who's on the road at 5.30 a.m. driving the speed limit. Who does that? <laughs> and you can tell by my, I get irritated. I'm like, just 5.30 in the morning. How can I, first of all, be stuck behind the only other person on the road? And why are they driving this slow? This is the time to speed. Get there. Don't even stop for the traffic light. Nobody's around. Just keep going. Where am I going in such a hurry? I don't know. But road rage is terrible. 
People are giving each other their universal sign of displeasure, you know, driving around. People are tailgating. It's terrible. It's terrible. Noah Robertson and Pat, Patrick Johnson, I think, make an important observation. He, they say, hey, this isn't the first year that anger has defined life in America. A country that was built by revolution. Maybe it's in our DNA. They say anger is a complicated emotion. It unites and divides. It fixes social problems and creates them. It led both to the civil rights movement and the civil war. So what do we do with all this anger? What do we do with all this rage that we're a part of? We're breathing in. It's around us everywhere. You know, I was uh, preparing for this message and I went back. I had preached from this text some years ago, back in 2015. And uh, speaking of road rage, I just happened to notice in my notes here. Uh, I, I was driving in Salem in October. If you're from Massachusetts and you know Salem, Massachusetts in October, it's Halloween, the traffic is terrible. And I was driving in the car and I went past the guy and I could hear him say, this is what he said. <laughs> oh my goodness. He said, I could see it now. Uh, in the paper, man in Cooper runs down 40 people. He's mad. What do we do with all this rage and anger that just seems to be everywhere? Well, I think Jesus has something to say about that in our text. Now, there are a couple of things we want to clear up before we get to the heart of what Jesus is saying here. First of all, I want you to notice that Jesus is not uh, undoing or mitigating the Ten Commandments here. This is the first time in the Sermon on the Mount, this is the first point where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said of old. That's how rabbis would teach. They would bring up the Ten Commandments that way. And uh, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said of old, to those of old, right? Whoever murders, right, will be guilty of the judgment. But I say to you, right? It's not like he's doing away with the Ten Commandments. He's not saying this isn't important anymore. Really what Jesus is doing here is he's really getting literally to the heart of the commandments. He's talking about issues of the heart. He's saying it's not enough to just kind of obey the commandments on the surface. We have to obey them from the heart. Now, I think it would be safe to say here this morning, at least I hope it's safe to say here this morning, that there isn't anyone in this room that has killed another person. I've not murdered anybody, right? Even an angry person might be able to say at the end of the week, hey, I got this one. Not going to kill anybody, right? But Jesus says, if that's you, you know, it's not enough. He's talking about issues of the heart. What's on the inside? David Buss of the University of Texas asked students, his students, if they had ever thought seriously about killing someone. And if so, he asked them to write out their homicidal fantasies in an essay. He was astonished to find that 91% of the men and 84% of the women had detailed vivid homicidal fantasies. He was even more astonished to learn how many steps some of his students had taken toward carrying those fantasies out. Yeah, anger's a problem. And when Jesus talks about the commandments here, he's saying it's not enough to just obey it, right? On the surface, he's saying, listen, we, what, what's going on in your heart? That's what he's addressing, first of all. So we got to clear that up, right? He's talking about what's going on in the heart. And again, you're going to see this more clearly in the next section on adultery. Pastor Eric will be covering that uh, next week, and he'll talk about that. But you'll see that more clearly there. So that's the first thing. Secondly, Jesus is not saying here that all anger is bad. He's not saying all anger is bad. Jesus himself got angry. If you ever read through the Gospels, you see Jesus getting angry. Uh, you might remember one incident from his life where he turned over tables in the temple, right? Came into the, I think what was the court of the Gentiles, and there were people were selling and buying stuff, right? And Jesus got angry. He started flipping over tables. Uh, one gospel says he made a whip and began to drive the people out. That's pretty angry. That's pretty angry. But of course, Jesus had righteous anger, didn't he? Right, we believe that Jesus was perfect, sinless. And so again, it, 
Not all anger is bad anger. There are things that we should be angry at. There are some things that should anger us. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 says this, Be angry and sin not. Or in your anger, do not sin. Indicating that there is an anger that is appropriate to the situation. There is anger that is appropriate. Now, men, don't go home and start flipping tables at home and, you know, pull your belt out and start, you know. Jesus did it. <laughs> but there are moments, again, when anger is appropriate. We are created with a capacity for anger. We see even God gets angry. Jesus gets angry, right? We have, uh, again, it's, it's not that kind of anger that Jesus is addressing here in our text. All right? When Jesus says, nah, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to the judgment, he's talking about a toxic, perhaps uncontrolled kind of anger. He's talking about the kind of anger that gets in there and takes root and begins to fester and grow, and it leads to all kinds of bad things. In our text, it leads to contempt. Notice what Jesus says. But I say to you, right? right? Anyone who says to his brother, Raka, will be liable to the council, right? You can be answerable to the council. Now, it sounds on one hand a little ludicrous, right? That you're going to end up before kind of like the Supreme Court here for insulting someone, right? But what Jesus is addressing is not just an insult. It's kind of the heart, again, that goes with it. He's talking about a kind of contempt that anger can lead us to. Right? When uh, this word raka here means more like uh, you nitwit or bonehead or numbskull or worse, idiot, perhaps. Come on, anybody ever been there? You got in a heated conversation, you called someone an idiot? I did it. Did it recently. I was having a conversation with someone I didn't even know online, and they said something that really irked me, and I said, no, idiot. I apologized. <laughs> she was very gracious. <laughs> very gracious. <laughs> I apologize. I said I should have never said that. I was, that was out of line. I am sorry. And by the end of our conversation, things were, were better. But that's the kind of anger that Jesus is addressing here. We get angry at stuff, and then we begin to have contempt for people. And this word, according to one dictionary, uh, says that it means the kind of contempt that we have for a person in what they think, maybe what they believe. You know, how could you think that way? What is wrong with you? You got rocks in your head? You know, that kind of thing. It is a contempt. It's a looking down on someone. Man, and that is so easy to get into, especially when we are angry. Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, anyone who says to his brother, you fool. He takes it to the next level. You fool. You'll be in danger of the fires of hell. And of course, the word fool here is a theologically loaded term. A Jewish believer sitting in the audience that day listening to this might call to their remembrance, right? Teaching that they find in the book of Proverbs. In other wisdom literature of the Old Testament, the Psalms, the book of Job, Ecclesiastes, right? Uh, a fool in the, in the book of Proverbs in particular is not just someone who makes poor decisions. It's not someone who, you know, is not smart enough to do the right thing. Fools in, in the book of Proverbs are people who have flawed character. And because of that, they make poor choices, bad choices, sinful choices, Right? The Psalms tell us a fool has said in his heart there is no God. This point, what Jesus is talking about is a kind of passing judgment on people. You fool. You, you God-forsaken idiot. Whatever we want. Right? It's, it's that kind of thing. And anger can lead to that. When we are angry, especially over something that we are deeply 
passionate about, maybe personal, could be a host of reasons. Man, when we get angry like that, we can begin to, we can begin to show contempt for people in incredible ways. And that's what this is. It's to show contempt for people, for what they think. And again, the same dictionary says for what they think and for their character. And that kind of anger, if it takes root, if it gets in there and it lodges itself in there and you nurse it and, and it festers, again, that can lead to all kinds of things. It can lead to kind of normal, what looks like normal relational conflict everywhere you go. It can create problems at work. It can create problems at home. It can create problems in your marriage, in your relationship to your kids. And it can certainly lead to murder. And that's the point that Jesus is saying. You know, what's going on on the inside? What's going on underneath the surface? Not on the outside, but inside. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? And then what is coming out of your mouth because of what you're thinking and what you have on the inside? I know you think, hey, that's not me. You know, yeah, I get mad. You know, I've done a few things. I slap some, I turn some tables over or whatever. But murder, no way. No way. Now, listen, truth be told, uh, in some ways, I'm an expert on anger. I grew up as an angry kid. I had a bad, bad temper. Probably learned a lot of that from my dad. Um, and as a Christian, I felt like I made some real progress, you know, until I got mad in front of my wife. And she had never seen that kind of anger. She thought, oh, my goodness. And I'm thinking, ah, this is pretty good. This is pretty mild. <laughs> and her concern was, oh, my goodness, you get that angry at something where could that lead? And I never really got that until I heard my neighbors once. Oh, my goodness. They were screaming and fighting and yelling. And I thought, somebody's going to get killed over there. And Jesus is kind of making that point. Anger's that powerful. Let me tell you a story about Carl Erickson, a 73-year-old South Dakota man who was sentenced to life in prison for admitting and committing the murder of a former high school classmate. Friends and family were shocked that he committed this crime, that the once successful insurance salesman just seemed to snap. Erickson had been married for 44 years. I mean, the kind of guy that you would look at and think on the outside, he's got it made. He's, everything is good. 73 years old. Lived his life, made a living, retired, put his kids through college, all that kind of stuff. But after the murder, Erickson's secret finally came out for over 50 years, for more than 50 years. He had nursed a grudge. This anger had simmered with a former classmate. Uh, a classmate had once put a jock strap on his head and made fun of him. And, and Erickson never got over it. This guy, Norman Johnson, that was the athlete and the murder victim. You know, just what happens in a locker room prank, right? He was the star uh, jock on the track team. And Erickson was the team manager, right? So you can imagine that. Here's the athlete and the team manager. Maybe the guy that, you know, loves sports, but, you know, just didn't have it athletically or physically couldn't do it and he's the team manager he's walking around with the clipboard and picking up the towels and doing all that kind of stuff and Johnson in a moment put a jock strap on his head and humiliated him and for 50 years Erickson nursed that anger and that grudge and then one day he had enough he went to Johnson's house rang the doorbell. When he opened the door, boom, he shot him, killed him. And now he's spending the rest of his life what's left in prison. Anger's that powerful. It can lodge itself inside of us and lead, again, to all kinds of brokenness and bad things. So what do we do? What do we do to break the vicious cycle of anger in our own lives and 
in really in the culture around us. Well, uh, let me give you a few things. Uh, James chapter 1 and verse 19 is a great place to start. Listen to what James writes. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, don't get angry in the first place. Right? Not, not this kind of anger. <laughs> not the kind of anger we've been talking about, right? There's times for it to be, for us to get angry at the right things, but we should be careful and cautious with anger. Be slow to anger. Take a step back, do some deep breathing, count to 10, whatever you got to do, but be slow to anger. Manage your anger. Be careful. Recognize when it, you know, the temperature is going up and take a step back and do what you got to do to sort of bring it under control. And the best thing is to really do your best to not get angry in the first place. Again, the wrong guy, you know, someone does something that insults you, brush it off. <laughs> take a deep breath. Count to 10. Go for a walk. Whatever you got to do, try not to let that anger get in and, and begin to take root. Here's another one. Minimize your online exposure. If you're like me and you can't control yourself online, <laughs> don't go there. Keep that time down to it. You know, I used to listen to a podcast on the way in, but man, I found that in, and it was dealing with cultural things. It was a cultural uh, analysis of what was going on in the culture from a Christian perspective. And I really enjoyed it a lot of times. But what I found is I was angry a lot of times after I got done hearing what was going on. I had to stop listening. I was like, you know what? This isn't good for me. Not first thing in the morning. Uh, and certainly not on the way home, right? I show up at house. I'm all ticked off, you know, kick the door open. Where's dinner? No. <laughs> so minimize your online exposure. If it's getting to you and driving you crazy, back it off. Pull it back. Get rid of the Instagram account or Facebook, whatever you got to do, and just minimize your, your online exposure. Uh, here's another one. Slow down. I already told you my driving experience, right? Slow down. Where are you going in a hurry? I find that I get angry when I'm in a hurry because something or someone blocks me. And then that's it, man. I am mad, right? Get out of my way, right? Uh, I was driving with my wife once, and that was the case. You know, cars in front of me slow. They don't realize I am someone important. I got places to go, and uh, they don't want to get out of the way. And uh, Nadine looked over at me and said, Yes, your highness, go get right out of your way. You know, like, that's how it is. Like, where am I going? Slow down. Just slow down. That will help. I find that so important. Uh, here's another one. Self-care is important. Uh, eat right, get some sleep, do some exercise, you know, things like that, right? I find when I'm not sleeping, I'm more irritable. When I'm not eating right, I'm more irritable because I don't feel good, right? If I'm... Loading up on sugar. I'm not saying anything about coffee. Please drink all the coffee you want. No, I'm just uh, I, I like my coffee. Right? Sugar, bad food, eating, how you feel, right? That all can affect your mood and how you respond to things. If you're not sleeping well, right? A better diet, better sleep, getting some exercise, all those kinds of things does help you cope and deal with things that could cause, uh, you know, anger uh, to flare up. So those are some things that you could do. But Jesus isn't really just talking about here. How can I, you know, deal with my anger in a general kind of a way? Jesus is really addressing people that have blown it, right? He's talking to people who've said something and done something to someone else, and they've blown it. What do we do in those cases? Right? And this actually is a step in breaking the cycle. And it's in a word, one word, reconciliation. Right? If you've messed up, reconcile. Listen to what he says. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come back and offer your gift. What's not apparent here at this point in Jesus's message, you have to remember he's speaking in Galilee. That's some 80 miles from Jerusalem where the altar was. So Jesus is saying to his audience, so if you're in Jerusalem, 
and you're offering your gift there and you remember, oh, yeah, my neighbor has something against me. He says, leave it and travel the 80 miles back home and make it right. No cars, no bus, right? You got to walk. You got to hoof it or ride a donkey or something. That's a little bit of time. You got a lot of time to think about what you're going to say when you get there and all that kind of stuff, right? But he's saying, leave it there and go all the way back home and make it right. And then go all the way back to Jerusalem and fix it. And 80 miles is going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take more than a, a day. It's going to take a lot of time. He's saying, do whatever is necessary to reconcile. It's not going to be easy, but do it. May cause, you know, you got to take a lot of steps and a lot of walking. There's going to be a lot that has to be done. And the word reconciliation itself implies some process. Things don't change in a moment, right? You might be able to repair. You might begin to, that process of, again, getting the relationship back to where it should be. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some humility. Really, it takes two things. Confession and repentance. Going to the person and saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I said. I was so angry. I should have never said that. I should have never called you a name. I should have never. I was, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And, and I will, by God's grace, not do that again. Help me. And here's the thing. Here's the point. Here's what I think Jesus is getting at. Your relationship with God is tied up in your relationship with other people. Jesus says, leave your all, leave the gift. It's not appropriate for you to worship me right now when you've got this other thing going on. Leave it, take care of that, then come back. That's huge. Your relationship, did you hear what I said? Your relationship with God is tied up in your relationship with other people. Broken relationships, unforgiveness, things that you've done that have not been resolved, that's going to impact your relationship with God. I'm not saying he's going to turn his back on you. I'm not saying any of that, but you know what? Uh, you may not experience his presence like you once did. And he's going to deal with you. And that's what he's getting at here. I don't have time for this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> that's what preachers do. Some years ago, our printer ran out of ink. And uh, because I was in a hurry, uh, I forgot to get the number and grab, I was going to grab actually the ink uh, cartridge and go to Staples on my way back to the church uh, and, you know, replace it. But I forgot because I was in a hurry. And so uh, when I left, I, and where we lived at the time, it was miserable. It wasn't like I could just turn around and come back. It was a crazy place where we lived. And uh, so I was like, ah, you know. So I get to Staples. I call Nadine. And I say, hey, honey, uh, I forgot to grab the cartridge. So would you go up to the printer and just open the top, not just the scanner part, but the whole thing. And the cartridge will slide and it'll be right there in front of you. And just give me the numbers and I can replace it. So she, I hear her go there. She, no, it didn't do that. I was like, no, no, you, not the scanner part. You got to like open the whole thing so that you're like looking inside the printer. She said, yeah, I did that. You know, it didn't happen. Are you sure? Yep. I said, close it and open it again. Yeah, no, it's nothing there. I said, do you have your glasses on? <laughs> I was getting irritated by the minute. I was like, you know, because I'm in a hurry. And so I finally just was like, oh, never mind. I'll just figure it out myself. And I hung up. And so I get the cartridge. I get it. And so at some point in the afternoon, I realized, oh, yeah, I blew it. That's pretty bad. But I decided when I got home, it was going to act like nothing happened. <laughs> and so I came home. And there she was doing something at the counter or whatever. And I came up behind her. I put my arms around her. And I said, yo, baby, what's up? <laughs> Gave her a kiss. Ice. Oh, cold. <laughs> Daggers. She just looked at me and said, you're rude. And I said, you're right. You're right. I'm rude. I should have never done that. I'm sorry. You know, like, my point is, you know, I can't act like everything is okay when everything is not okay. Right? 
can't do that. And even though I apologize, it's not like, you know, we just cuddled up on the couch afterward and, you know, everything was hunky-dory. It wasn't, right? Because, you know, I had let this anger out and it, right? There needed to be some reconciliation. I needed to fix the problem. I needed to make it right. That's what Jesus is saying. And our relationship to God is tied up with our relationship to others. Listen to this from 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Wow. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Right? It's the same kind of idea, isn't it? How can we say that we love God? We don't see him, but we hate our brother, right? Our relationship with others, right, is tied up in our relationship with God. Jesus himself would say in, in Matthew chapter 6, we'll get there eventually in this series, right? If you don't forgive others, right, you will not be forgiven. Again, it's another way of saying, listen to how our, our relationship to one another is tied up, all right? It affects our relationship with God, and our relationship with God is tied up in our relationship with others, And so if you're unwilling to reconcile, right, Jesus says, secondly, right, that's the first thing, reconcile, but the second thing, he says, do it quickly. And we we don't have time to really get into that, right? He says, listen, as you're on the road, you know, uh, uh, deal with it quickly, right? Fix it with your adversary quickly, lest when you get to the court, you find out you're guilty, right? You might not think it's a big deal. You might not think it's a big deal. You might think it was just a little thing and you don't need to do anything. Or, and if you're like me, maybe you like to avoid conflict and all of that stuff. And so you're going to put it off and put it off. Jesus said, no, deal with it quickly. Because what you might find is when you get there to the court, and of course Jesus is alluding to the ultimate court and the ultimate judge, you might find that you're a bit more guilty than you thought. Deal with it. Don't let it go. Deal with it quickly. Fix it. Make it right. Because it won't be right until it's made right to you. Ask for forgiveness for what you've done. And to not ask for forgiveness is a kind of a way of not forgiving, isn't it? Someone has done something, made us really anger, angry, and we respond and we say something, we hurt them, uh, but we really don't want to fix that relationship. It's kind of like an unforgiveness thing. And again, your relationship with God is tied up in your relationship to others. And so what do we do about anger? Well, we need to be very careful. Jesus is offering a significant warning, to say the least here, about this powerful emotion called anger. There's appropriate expressions of that, but he's saying, be careful. Don't let it take root. Don't let it fester. And if you've got something in it, you feel like it's starting to fester, then you need to go and reconcile and do that quickly. Now, this is the point where I'm going to offend someone. Cats never forgive. (laughs) Literally, scientists have observed conciliatory behavior in many different animal species, uh, most of them primates like gorillas and chimps, who often follow confrontations with friendly behavior like hugging and kissing. And that is even present in some non-primate animals, like goats and hyenas, if you can believe it. But not cats. The only species that has so far failed to show outward signs of reconciliation are domestic cats. And so my point is, when it comes to anger, don't be like a cat. (laughs) Fix it. Deal with it and deal with it quickly. You know, before we dismiss here, we want to just uh, give you an opportunity to worship the Lord with your tithes and your offerings and missions giving and all the ways that you give here. Of course, there are a number of ways to do that here. Um, You can text. You can give through our website, cornerstonecheshire.com. You can use envelopes that are available in the seat in front of you and fill out uh, one of those and place it in one of the offering boxes uh, at the back of the church. A number of ways that you can give here, and we appreciate your faithfulness uh, in giving. And if you gave your life to Christ today, uh, we would love to know that. If you've just taken a simple step, I know we didn't go into any real lengthy thing about that, but if you've given your life and you just said, hey, I'm 
I'm surrendering to Jesus today. You can use a connection card found in your, the seat in front of you. Uh, and let us know, or you can text the word BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. And uh, we'll get that, and then we'll know that you've done that. And we'd love to help you in your walk and relationship with, with God. Uh, I want to pray before I let you go. Can I do that? Yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you today. Thank you for uh, this time together. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you have blessed us. It's our joy to give. And uh, we ask you to receive these offerings and use them to advance um, your kingdom, your grace around the world, Lord. Uh, Take it and use it for your glory and honor, we pray. And Lord, we ask that you bless us as we go, as you send us out into the world uh, to be salt and light in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week.